Hey there, everyone. Today on the final bar, the equity average is down after today's Apple event. Is this a confirmed lower high for technology stocks? Big tech pulling back, but energy financials showing renewed strength today. David Cox of Raymond James is going to be joining us from Ontario. Offense over defense. What makes sense at this point in the cycle? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market action using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is really designed to help you understand what's happening in the markets by focusing on the markets themselves. We can talk about what could happen, what should happen, what might happen. I don't think those are bad things to do, as long as you don't get too tied to a narrative and start ignoring the evidence. But most important thing is to focus on the charts and focus on what actually is happening and think about how that relates to those other disciplines. One of the things I always try to remind people, I've had a lot of questions about relating fundamental and technical analysis, among other things. And I always remind people, I think there's a good place for both of those disciplines. And I think overweighting your thinking in one versus the other usually gets you into trouble. If you lean too much at the stories and the possibilities and the earnings growth, but ignore the charts, you will often own good companies that are just not good stocks at any given moment. If you ignore the fundamentals of the company, you have to remember that over the long term, that's where stocks tend to go to. They tend to go to proper valuations based on what these companies are doing. But in the short term, it's driven by the uh, technical push and pull between supply and demand. So thinking holistically, thinking about how, how all the charts we talk about on today's show relate to all of the other macroeconomic and fundamental and quantitative events out there, I think makes you a well-rounded well investor. We have a great guest today, David Cox from uh, Raymond James, going to be share, sharing with you some really interesting charts addressing a couple topics, but particularly offense versus defense. That's a discussion I've had uh, a lot recently, and I think it's an important uh, area to, uh, to focus on. With that as a backdrop, let's start with our market recap and see what happened through the course of the day today with some technology and growth sectors pulling back a bit. Before we get there, by the way, let's ask a question. Will September 2023 be a positive or negative month for the S&P 500? I love simple questions uh, with simple answers that have a lot of rigor and a lot of uh, you know questions that kind of build on that. 43% of you said it's going to be a good uh, positive month for stocks, which means 57% say it's going to be a, a negative month for the S&P 500. Now, so far, we can see what's happened uh, through the course of this month. August, of course, sort of a V-shaped month. You had the sell-off in the first half, a rally in the second half. Coming out of the Labor Day holiday, we rolled over a little bit. And now we're sort of in that uncertain question mark kind of phase. September, if you look back, and uh, we, we recorded uh, charting forward, our big market outlook special just a couple hours ago. And uh, one of our uh, guest contributors, Tom Boley, mentioned that September, particularly the last 10 months of September going back, tend to be really rough for stocks, tend to be one of the weakest times. And some of those days have been some of the worst days of the year. And so we're kind of at that point. Uh, where September is usually a pretty rough time. And we're at that point where I would say there's some uncertainty certainly starting to uh, uh, present itself. So I would probably agree September is going to be a negative month. But let's let the charts tell us uh, what's happening and, uh, and what may come next. Let's get to our market recap. And as I, as I mentioned, a bit of a, a rougher day. It was a choppy day and sort of a couple different phases through the course of the day, kind of a three-step uh, day, an initial sell-off out of the open, sort of a rally through the lunchtime hour, and then the afternoon coming, uh, coming right back down. At the end of the day, the S&P finishing uh, right around 44.62, and that's down 0.6% from uh, Tuesday's close. The Nasdaq composite down 1.1%, uh, uh, and so that's down around 130. Uh, sorry, 13,770. Uh, we can see mid caps and small caps essentially flat for the day, so no real change there. And I think that lack of participation uh, of small caps has been something many of us have recognized, right? The IWM or the S&P 600 uh, kind of lagging behind so far in 2023, and that's been one of the question marks, but the mega cap stocks have done so well that a lack of participation from small caps hasn't been a huge issue. Um, but at what point do you need to see some improvement in the small cap space to feel better about sort of a risk on mentality? I don't think we've necessarily uh, seen that yet. The VIX uh, pushing a little bit higher, but not by much. Currently just above 14 at 1420, we'll call it. And again, the VIX, the move index, these are measures of volatility looking at the options market and the sort of implying a volatility 
uh, for the uh, underlying assets. I think uh, low volatility, steady uptrend has been the story for much of 2023. I'll be watching the VIX to see if we get a spike. That's usually not a good thing for stocks, particularly after our rally phase to see a spike in volatility. For now, we're not really seeing that uh, necessarily. The yield curve, for the most part, moving down. Again, not a huge down day for, uh, for interest rates, not a huge up day for uh, bond prices. Ten-year yields finishing the day around 426. The long bond yield around 435. The TLT, which is a bond ETF, a uh, treasury bond ETF, up about 0.6%. The dollar index up slightly from uh, yesterday as well. Looking at the commodity space, that was another big theme that came out of our, uh, our uh, charting forward market outlook special, which we'll be releasing uh, tomorrow. Uh, commodities, uh, you know, is there an opportunity to rotate into a space that is, you know, uh, certainly showing uh, some potential signs of strength here? The DBC up uh, just over a third of a percent to 2530. Gold and silver prices uh, down a bit. The GLD was down about a half a percent. Energy prices looking at crude oil, natural gas, all uh, in the green. The energy sector having a pretty good update. And that's, uh, I guess, uh, uh, good to see after yesterday where energy pulled back quite a bit. A lot of energy stocks showed a bit of a um, uh, bearish uh, engulfing pattern, uh, which is a candle pattern suggesting short-term weakness. A lot of those things were covering right back from the uh, losses that they posted on uh, yesterday's session. Finally, a lot of green in the cryptocurrency space. We're talking about Bitcoin in that 25,000 level. For now, continuing to hold in the last 24 hours, we've tested 25,000 and bounced off of again. Now, that was the low from a couple months ago. We're once again sort of confirming that level of support. All green for the top 10 uh, cryptocurrencies that we track on our platform with Bitcoin just below 26,100 and Ether prices testing 1,600. Uh, big round number, always something to, uh, to watch. Finally, looking at sector performance, it was energy and financials and then everything else today. Energy stocks up 2.3%. Uh, and again, some of the charts that we'll, we'll try to get to, things like Oxy and, and really the XLE. I mean, really, when you take a step back, impressive rotation higher uh, in the last couple months. And, and, and for now, days like this just reinforce that upward trend that we've been observing for, uh, for a little while. Financials have certainly not been an area of market strength uh, recently, but you're seeing a nice jump in some of those areas, particularly some of the regional banks uh, having a nice bounce. Uh, we'll talk about maybe key and PNC and others, uh, time permitting. Utilities and real estate, which are two of the more defensive sectors you could come up with, basically flat for the day, so outperforming the, uh, the S&P. Now, the reason why the S&P is down, if you think about the sector weightings, is the three most meaningful sectors, certainly the three uh, dominant sectors, the growthy sectors, of technology, communication services, and consumer discretionary, all in the red. Technology leading the way lower, 1.8%. Communications down 1%. Consumer discretionary down 0.8%, similar to uh, consumer staples, actually. Now, within technology, we had Oracle, uh, we had Apple, both sort of moving lower on earnings on uh, Apple's new product uh, announcements, the, the iPhone 15, et cetera, today. Uh, let's get through all of those charts, or as many as we certainly can here. Start with a daily chart of the S&P 500. Now, you know, we've talked about sort of this three-wave pattern, or for now a two-wave pattern we've observed, that initial sell-off in July uh, into August, really. And remember, the S&P made a new swing high, uh, topping out right around 4,600 in the last week of July. From there, we rotated lower. We didn't quite get to 4,300. That's held so far as support. That's the top, uh, sort of right around this pink-shaded area here. And then we bounced back above there, back above the 50-day moving average for about a week. And now we're once again sort of testing that, uh, that key uh, barometer, the 50-day moving average. Today, we close back below after yesterday's session closing back uh, above. And sorry, I think I mentioned the wrong days. Tuesday today, after Monday's close above the 50-day, today we're back, uh, we're back below the 50-day uh, the moving average. And not that that is the only thing to pay attention to, but what I found with moving averages, there are a couple basic sort of guiding principles of trend following that I found really helpful. If you know nothing else about a chart, Look at the moving averages. Are they sloping up or are they sloping down? And while that doesn't tell you everything about the nuances, about the subtleties of supply and demand and fear and greed that play out on a day-to-day -day basis, it does give you the trend. And that is the idea of a moving average is it smooths out the trend, it smooths out the noise, and helps you focus on the larger, on the bigger picture. So the 50 and 200-day moving averages for the S&P still sloping higher. So 
Even though we've been chopping around, even though we've pulled back a bit off of the high in uh, July, things are not broken when I think about the overall, uh, the overall phase here. Now, there are some pretty important levels that I would say if we would break below there, I think you could describe the S&P as more broken or certainly less uh, optimistic, but we're pretty far away from there, right? We've sort of bounced off of that, uh, uh, that support level in mid-August. So for now, I'd look to see if this is a continuation of that initial uh, sort of drop. And if you think about this, as an ABC pattern, which would be the initial sell-off the first couple weeks in August, a rally into late August, early September, and then we would have a parallel move down. That would take us down sort of in that 4250, 4300-ish uh, type of range. That would line up really well with a trend line taking the October low and the March low. That's right around that level, the 200-day moving average, not too far uh, below there, a Fibonacci support around 4180 all kind of a confluence of support, all, all kind of around that, that area. And I, I can't guarantee that's where this will end, but you know, I often think, what's my initial, what is my initial observation when I see the chart? What am I drawn to? And I'm drawn to this idea that this could be now the wave C that we've been looking for. Now, we have a lot of potential catalysts this week. I think Apple's product announcement today could be part of that. We're seeing some negative movement in technology uh, after that. Certainly, Oracle coming down is a, is a part of that. Uh, technology weakness story uh, as well. Inflation data coming out on uh, tomorrow on Wednesday session. Uh, we have a new uh, AI fueled IPO, uh, a company called Arm. Uh, all of these things are potential market moving events. So I think by the end of the week, maybe we have a little more clarity as to what sort of wave we might be in. But for now, I'm seeing short term uh, deterioration be my main observation, particularly in the growthy, uh, the growthy sectors. We're going to talk about offense and defense with my guest today, so I don't want to spend too much more time on that, but I do want to just uh, briefly touch on Bitcoin because it's had a pretty good bounce. And yesterday on the show, we were talking about how we were retesting that 25,000 level once again. The reason why we've highlighted that level, a couple of reasons. First, that was the support in June. And so, you know, one of the reasons why this show is called The Final Bars, because when I've taught technical analysis to novice investors, to new analysts, to uh, college students, what I say is start with the final bar and then look to the left. That's kind of your basic process of how to analyze price behavior. Don't start to the left like you're reading a book in English. Start with the right and look to the left because you want to start with where we're at relative to where we've been. And if you start with the final bar and look to the left, you'll see that we're lining up pretty well with that low in June. And that is important because the markets tend to have memory. Levels of support and resistance tend to persist because investors remember what levels we turned at and they find uh, that that's an opportunity to revisit a particular thesis. That low in June also lines up with a Fibonacci level. So if you take the low in November of last year, the high in April, and I would consider June and July of this year is kind of a retest of that April peak. If you take that framework, 38.2% of the way down is right about at 25,000. So we have a number of things suggesting this would be a pretty decent support level. And that's really where Bitcoin has been bouncing for the last three to four weeks. So bouncing off of there for now, I think as long as 25,000 holds, this is still sort of a pause, a consolidation within a nice recovery. We break 25,000, all of a sudden we have to start talking about, talking about double top patterns and measuring downside objectives, and it gets a lot murkier for Bitcoin going forward. So I think we're right at a key level. And I think it's worth noting in the last couple of days, we have tested that once again, and for now that support level uh, appears to be holding. Now, let's talk about some of the sectors uh, on the move today. We'll start with uh, financials. I and mean, if you look at the XLF, you'll, you'll see why this is not one of those obviously the strongest charts I've ever seen type of announcements. Uh, the chart of the XLF reminds me a lot of the chart of small caps, right? The IWM. It's sort of in this consolidation phase. Really hasn't followed through. And what's interesting is you think about growth sectors like technology, communication services have been in pretty good uptrends and now pulling back. You think about energy, which had been pulling back and now starting to rotate higher. Financials are kind of like in the middle. If you look at where we're at right now and you look to the left, you can see we're at the same place about a year and a half ago, right? April of last year, we're kind of right around these same levels. We're just sort of chopping around. This is a big consolidation phase that we've, we've experienced. What's happening, though, is we're bouncing off of the 200-day, and in the short term, we're starting to see some improvement. On a chart like this, I immediately look to the bottom to see if and when the relative strength really starts to improve. Because what that would tell me is that it's becoming an opportunity relative to other bets that I could be making. Right now, you're seeing stronger relative strength in areas like energy uh, and, uh, and, and, and other sectors that have done much better on, a, uh, on, a, on an absolute and now on a relative basis. But that is where I would immediately uh, be drawn to. Now, with that as the backdrop, though, think about a chart like Zion. 
which today is closing just barely above the 200-day moving average, but it did it. Zion is one of those regional banks that's tested the 200-day a number of times over the last 12 months and has failed to break above it until today. We did it briefly in February of, uh, of this year. Once again, we're kind of testing that 200-day. I was taught nothing good happens below the 200-day, so I'm often uh, looking for areas like this that have been below for so long and all of a sudden are breaking above their 200-day moving average. That tells me to revisit this and see if there might be an opportunity that hasn't presented itself for quite some time because we're now starting to trade above that longer-term uh, measure of trend. You also see some interesting charts when you look at like PNC, uh, or key, and you're getting a bit of a what I'd call a bullish divergence, sort of a shorter term time frame. But what I'm talking about when I say a bullish divergence would be this. We have lower lows in price, August into September, higher lows in the RSI. So lower prices, higher momentum or less low momentum really often suggests the end of that trend and a reversal back to the upside. So uh, some of the regional banks jumping pretty nicely today, PNC up almost 6%. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that comes after this bullish divergence, suggesting the downside momentum starting to dissipate a little bit or starting to lighten up and could be the beginning of a rotation higher. Again, look with PNC how below, how far below it is the 200-day moving average. It's been a while since we've really been above and, and been in any sort of uptrend as defined by, uh, by, by uh, moving averages. So interesting that we may have been putting in a higher low, a nice rally off of the lows. I'd love to see further follow through to sort of confirm that uptrend uh, that we uh, that we uh, described there. Within the energy sector, charts like Oxy, again, as I'm taking a step back, I'm seeing this sort of rounded bottoming pattern, a basing pattern, if you will, but really starting to improve, making higher highs and higher lows, up another 4% today. The momentum overall has been pretty constructive. And if you zoom into the last year, you'll see what I'm talking about, right? This has sort of been a sideways pattern. A, a basing pattern is something where you can kind of draw a rectangle around the price action. Find consistent support around 56, we'll call it, consistent resistance around 60. 65 to 66, we're kind of testing that resistance range yet again after making a series of higher lows uh, above the 50-day moving average, now back above the 200-day, seems to be setting up for further upside. I'd love to see it clear that base, and that's the question for a lot of these energy stocks is can they not just trade up to resistance but trade through it and, and show some follow-through above there, but overall pretty, uh, pretty constructive. Finally, we have to talk a little bit about technology. Oracle, of course, one of the earnings uh, names this week. There are a couple uh, uh, companies in sort of the, the mega cap growth space uh, announcing Oracle. Kind of a disappointing quarter, uh, disappointing guidance. Stock down almost 14%, gapping lower uh, and then trading lower as well. Below this key support level, and what you have to remember, um, the reason why support and resistance are so helpful, because it gives you a line in the sand. It gives you a level to wait for, and, and, and what you're looking for is to see when we break through that level. So a level of resistance, like we saw in mid-June, the question is, do we get above there? And we never really did, right? As of yesterday's close, we're st sort of still testing that resistance. Today, all of a sudden, we're gapping lower and we're breaking through support. After a big gap lower, it's always interesting to see the day after, right? Now that we've sort of processed this, do we see buyers coming in and identifying this weakness and they're thrilled to get Oracle at a 15% discount, a 14% discount? Um, that's the question. So I think through uh, Wednesday into Thursday, see if, uh, if, if some buying uh, power enters in and we start to see some accumulation. For now, cert certainly seems to be in a, uh, in a uh, position of short-term weakness. That's our market recap for today. So many charts to, uh, to touch on. We get to as many as, uh, as we can. A couple quick announcements before we bring on today's guest, uh, David Cox. First off, we welcome your questions. The mailbag is such a fun part of the show. We love going through the questions that you're coming into, highlighting some of the questions that we're getting and answering them using the Stock Charts platform. Our mailbag could use some more questions. Won't you help us out and email us? What are you running into as you were analyzing the charts, as you were using the Stock Charts platform to try to make sense of these markets? Our email is the final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at final bar SCTV. And on our YouTube channel, of course, just drop a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts TV YouTube channel. Don't forget our other channel, by the way, called Stock Charts, because we have a really cool documentary that has just been posted uh, in the last week or two, talking about a pivotal part of uh, market history. I'll leave it at there, but make sure you check it out. Really well done by one of our, uh, one of our producers, uh, Abara Sonder. 
Next is uh, we have a YouTube live Q&A every Wednesday. I'll be setting up in our podcast studio right around the corner tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. That is a live Q&A. It'll be driven 100% or maybe 90% on your questions. I'll start with a couple setup charts just to sort of uh, set the stage, and then we'll get to the questions that you have. We can go anywhere you like, and we'll have the charts available to uh, to, uh, to have some great visuals for that discussion. So go to our YouTube channel. Make sure you set your notification. You won't miss uh, our uh, live Q&A tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. I want to welcome on today's guest, David Cox. David's a portfolio manager at Raymond James, coming to us from Waterloo, Ontario. David, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm, I'm great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. And yeah, it's always good to chat. No, it's good to see you. And, and as always, you, you brought a lot of charts to sort of uh, share some of your thinking this is an interesting time, right? We're sort of in this, you know, a, a question mark, I think, for a lot of investors. It seemed very clear for a while, this growth-driven bull market phase. Now it feels like everything's been turned over a little bit, and, and I think people are struggling to figure out what may be next. Now, there's no denying we've started to see, you know, a rotation higher in 2023, short-term weakness. But set the stage in terms of correlations and what these different sectors mean relative to one another. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the market to me is is big, right? You got the S and P 500, and within it, we've got all these sectors, and the sectors are different, right? They offer not only differing properties to some degree, as you already pointed out, things like communications and technology and discretion. There's a lot of relation there, and so if you look at, for example, correlation stats, you'll see a high numbers there. Whereas areas like utilities and, and energy actually are quite a bit lower. Um, the problem is, of course, is that you know, again, when we run into a market correction, risk is is a little bit kind of harder to you start to feel it more when markets come down. We start to be more more exposed. And this chart here is actually on the x-axis. We've got the uh, what, what I consider to be an ATR divided by price. So to keep that simple, what that is, is kind of an estimated average percentage change we'd expect if we were an investor in one of these areas. So the S&P 500 sitting to the left, more diverse as an index, is going to be more, you know, less volatile rather. And technology sitting on the far right there is the most volatile of the four ETFs that are shown. So when we invest, I, I like to go and dig deeper into even these sectors to see what the constituents look like kind of thing. Uh, but the perspective is, is that energy has obviously come back a long way, and it does offer diversifying properties given its limited correlation, which is nice to see. Whereas utilities, yeah, I think it's been going downwards. And so you're diversifying, but you're diversifying into a downtrend. Mm, doesn't sound like an ideal option or an ideal lever to be pulling. Talk to us a little bit more about the relative performance, really the relative movements of some of these sectors. And you've got a couple different uh, highlighted here, energy, communication services, utilities. What do you make of the performance here recently? Yeah, so I mean, to me, there's there's three examples here. These are so these are actually not relatives. These are just absolute charts. So we've mm -hmm. got energy. If you look, these are one year charts. Let's call them pretty much. Um, so energy coming back up here to where it was, you know, before it started to fall, um, you know, essentially. And whereas we've got communications, which has been a strong uh, sector the entire time, and then we've got the utilities on the right side, which has pretty much been very consistent as well, going downwards the entire time. So to me, as we're building portfolios, anyone, I mean, we should be also first off understanding trend. So market trend first, sector trend next, and then starting to look within the stock level. And I think it's very important because, again, as I just pointed out, it's one thing to say that energy and utilities aren't very, you know, uh, you know, correlated, let's say, to discretionary and technology. Mm -hmm. But it's another thing to say one is going upwards in the last many months and one is going straight downwards, which isn't very attractive on the bottom line. Mm, and it's, it's amazing how well or I guess how poorly uh, some of the defensive sectors have, have been. And, one, and one, I guess one of the big reasons why uh, it's, it's been hard to get too bearish on the markets is because defensive sectors have been so underwhelming. Your next chart really illustrates some of those relative movements. Talk us through this one. This is one, by the way, you shared on your last uh, appearance, which I, I thought was brilliant. Can you talk through this one again? I, I did. So in, in a correction, you know, so first off, let's just talk about this. So this is just discretionary and technology kind of combined into a composite. And the right side is utility staples. The underneath panels are just versus the S&P 500. Okay. So clearly on the left side, we can agree technology and discretionary. I've got to say absolute uptrend in the top, right? Absolute on a line chart basis. And on a relative basis, that's an, that's an uptrend. I mean, there, there's, we just made new relative highs. Mm. And on the left, on the right side, rather, what we've got is I think we see lower highs, lower lows in the top panel. And we've got the same lower relative lows in the bottom. So if I was sitting here looking at a market and, and watching, let's say, August unfold, markets correcting 
interesting, which it is, you know, I look at this and I say, wow, I really don't see a lot of relative behavior that, that looks concerning to me. Mm. Um, you know, we can certainly understand that stocks can have weak days and strong days, but as a basket, there's been no movement out of these de defensive areas at all. And I, again, they're relative charts. So let's always remember that a relative chart can look pristine, but the absolute can be going down. And we want to obviously be aware of that. But I think I'm showing here that, you know, the left side, the right side and the top there, the trends themselves on an absolute basis are still very intact. Um, mm. So I really don't see much concerning to suggest that there's anything more than a pullback underway at a seasonally challenged time. Yeah, so that, that I, so I, you brought up right at the end, because I was just going to say, it seems like a weird seasonal time for this to be playing out the way it is. I mean, it's it sort of, I guess, I guess not, not really, right? I mean, se September tends to be pretty rough. I shared with, uh, in the market recap, some of the stats on, on September being weakness. Do you think that still fits into the short-term pullback, but long-term still uptrend sort of thesis? Or do you see anything that would tell you otherwise? I, I really don't. I mean, there's a lot of noise, obviously, at the stock level, but I, there's really no big picture change. I mean, you, you really should see the relative performance on that right side should be picking up if this was yeah. a serious kind of move here. And and the VIX, I mean, the VIX didn't even move up enough to you know get too excited at all. So I really don't see any reason yet. Uh, and it, it could change any time, but I, I don't see a lot of reasons here for over concern. I think it yeah. looks like a pullback and an uptrend and it's September. And it, I, you know, I meant to ask you about this before when we were prepping for the show, David. I know on social media you often share some checklists that you have, and I couldn't help but notice the last one you did. And one of them is sort of like an overall market conditions. One of them is, is it safe to buy? And I couldn't help but notice as I was looking through the checks, some of which you've addressed already, things weren't that bad. Can you just talk briefly about what those checklists do and why you follow that sort of rigorous list to identify opportunities in the market? For sure. I, I think routine and process is, is absolutely mm. important. And so I like to do the same thing always, you know, whether it's a daily process or a weekly process, a monthly process, you do the same thing and it just gives you a feel. And, and mm. I'm still a manual person. Yeah, those checklists that I post, they're actually like hand ticked. I sit at my desk and tick them off every, every day and every week that I do them. And they, they, they give you perspective. And there's something mm. about you can't get it from a, just a simple, you know, kind of quantitative website that shows you that, right? There's something about me looking at every one of those charts. So I like to look at, you know, the averages, you, you already referenced average slopes. I think that's very important. Mm. So looking at that short-term trend as we weaken, does it turn into intermediate term trend? Does it turn into long-term trend weakness and how that rotation, it all becomes very visible when you put it all together. So from a big picture standpoint, you're right. There's not a lot going on from, uh, you know, your typical risk off behavior, you know, volatility, bonds, staples, there's just nothing going on. And so it's tough to get over really bearish. Um, and at the same time, you know, there's a loud chorus of people wanting to be bearish. I feel like that's <laughs> been the case for a while, but they're not looking at the charts, I don't think. Mm. Yeah, we're kindred spirits, David. And that's why I wanted to ask you about it. I, I also do the manual process in a notebook and every week. And I, I don't think I'm going to change that anytime soon. So thanks for reinforcing that behavior for me. I feel better about it. Um, you know, just to finish off our discussion here, let's talk a little bit about commodities. Commodities are an area of the market where we're starting to see a bit of an improvement, but now, you know, I, I guess the question is, where's the opportunity going forward? Energy has been one of the top sectors here recently at the top of the leaderboard again today. When you yep. look at the commodity space, do you see signs uh, for optimism or not so much? I, I think commodities have bottomed. I think they've now broken out. And I think they're in a new uptrend again. So I mm. think that this is very important because it has tremendous implications from not only a sectoral standpoint and market standpoint, but also when we get into looking at what to expect underneath, because mm. the left chart there, that's a relative chart of the S&P 500 divided by commodities. So, you know, it went down as commodities surged out of 2020, essentially. Stocks have been outperforming there from the bottom of 2022, right? And they've been going upward. But again, that's just a, you know, argue a three wave up and and the and as i see that macd histogram start to deteriorate i see the bearish divergence and again looking at those absolute charts i still see an s p 500 looks good but commodities are now freshly breaking out there's mm. the three month performance on the right side you've more than three axed the performance recently and again so when you're starting to see things like energy stocks which actually led crude oil 
crude oil had not come out of that kind of, you know, I think the mm. 83, 84 level. So seeing energy stocks lead that to me, that looks very bullish. And that looks to me like the investors were willing to sign up for the higher beta trade. And now you're seeing oil come out. So again, to me, it adds up to here comes commodities again. And so let's be open minded. Hopefully people haven't forgotten because this is what happens as things rotate, right? Mm. They, they, things get old and they're unwilling to look, go there again. But I, I think this is very important again. And again, as you know, it has implications for things like interest rates and inflation. So with that in mind, just to wrap up here, we've got a big CPI number potentially happening this week. I know there are a lot of, a lot of eyeballs on that number to see what that implies about future Fed action through the course of this year into next year. Tell, talk to us a little bit about the trends in CPI, what that means for commodities as a whole. Yeah, so the, the, the CPI is in the top there. That's the US CPI annual, right? 3.1%. I mean, a huge move, right? Obviously. Mm. And again, let's not even get into data changes and calculation changes. I mean, that's another whole argument. But when I see, you know, commodities in the bottom, and you'll see I plot vertical lines there when you've got a turn up of the year over year change in the commodity index itself. And I mean, you're mm. typically going to expect it to lead to inflation. I mean, that's a, a rate of change, right? And so from that perspective, here comes commodities turning back upwards, but this is just a rate of change, right? And so yeah, it's down. But again, look at the charts. They're actually breaking out and we've got an absolute uptrend. So given everything I see, and I look, I look at crude oil where it is, which is a big component, no doubt about mm. it. What I see is, is I think commodities have turned back upwards. I think that's going to feed into higher inflation, which is going to cause a new problem for those that are sitting back hoping for rate decreases or whatever it is they want. Right. <laughs> and that is tremendous. It, it's a problem. I mean, yeah. who's kidding who? If yeah. we end up seeing continued sort of pressure on bond prices that, you know, are weak. I mean, again, this interest sensitivity that we also already spoke of, of staples and utilities, very related to the same concept. So there are some macro factors that are very, very important here to kind of make sure we see, I think. Dave, this is awesome. I love you touch on so many different uh, interesting uh, topics about diversification, about offense versus defense, things to think about in terms of inflation data and commodities. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Would love to have you back. But until then, be well and stay safe there uh, in Ontario. We'll see you, David. Thanks very much. That's David Cox. David's a portfolio manager at Raymond James, a really thoughtful analyst and uh, really knows the technical discipline. And what I love about talking with people like David is he's not just looking at the charts. Uh, David is one of those that has the CFA and the CMT and has studied all sorts of different uh, uh, disciplines. And I love thinking about how they relate to one another. When you know something like uh, CPI numbers coming out, when you know something like economic data is coming out, recognizing the information that you can draw out of the charts to help you prepare for that sort of thing and just think about what might come next. Uh, can't, can't, uh, can't overstate the value of charting there. Great take there, as always, by David Cox of Raymond James. We've got to wrap this show, folks, and go right to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. Talked about technology in our market recap again, energy really getting it done, sectors like technology and other growth sectors pulling back a little bit. And that's a, sort of a familiar pattern that we've seen. Now, Apple, of course, with big product announcements today, talking about new versions of the uh, AirPods Pro, a new iPhone model, very expensive products to be sure, but you know, products that have really helped Apple become a dominant force in the, uh, in the modern economy, just the size of Apple versus other sectors, right? Apple on its own outweighs a number of S&P sectors combined. That's how big of a, of a weight it is. It's coming down. And what concerns me when I see Apple and Oracle and others, when I feed, see those big growth sectors at the bottom of the, of the return list, it doesn't matter how good energy or financials or healthcare or any of those sectors are, the benchmarks are going to be weaker. And what I think that presents is often an opportunity where there's this disconnect between stocks that actually could be just fine and sectors that could do well. Just the major benchmarks may not reflect that. So watching a chart like Apple for now, it's sort of bending but not broken. And think about what levels would tell you this chart is really starting to deteriorate. And I'm looking at support around 170. That's based on previous lows in August. That's based on a Fibonacci level, the 200-day moving average, not too far below around 164. We hold those levels. This still very much fits into the pullback within a constructive uh, trend sort of uh, narrative. We start breaking those levels. That's where I think you need to revisit that and think about further downside protection and downside risk. Chart number two, the Russell 2000 ETF. We talked, as I mentioned, in our charting forward special. We'll release that tomorrow. Great market outlook discussion. We talked a lot about small caps, actually, and I, I didn't realize we were going to go there, but we ended up talking a lot about just the relationship between large cap and small caps, between the relative performance of these different areas of the market, the dominance of mega cap 
stocks, particularly in the growth space, but just the fact that the Russell 2000 still has not broken out. Now, there certainly seems to be presenting an opportunity here. When you have a big base, I was taught the bigger the base, the higher in space, the broader the top, the bigger the drop or something like that. I'm misquoting it, but... Uh, you know, when I'm when I'm thinking about that, right, the longer a base, uh, you know, sort of plays out, the longer that we're in that consolidation phase, it makes a breakout even more meaningful. And I'm looking at this chart, setting alerts for that sort of 195 to 200 level on the IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF. Breaking above there all of a sudden is a very different look to this chart uh, and something that's rotated from a more of a consolidation phase to arguably a new accumulation phase. I think there could be opportunity when the chart tells you that that's the case. For now, though, continuing to underperform. Finally, with financials, I always try to try to tell people on a day when utilities or real estate or financials have a pretty good day, I always like to look at a longer term chart and just think about how today's move fits into the big picture. I'm impressed by what I'm seeing in the short term by some of the regional banks. Nice bounces this week so far. I think there's potential, given the interest rate environment, for stocks like that to do better. But the charts are not really indicating that it's a new bullish phase just yet. I'm encouraged by a higher low for the XLF right at its 200-day moving average. That keeps happening. We keep making higher highs and higher lows. I think this chart get, gets better and better. But similar to small caps, I'd love to see us break out of these range. I'd love to see the relative strength improve in sectors like uh, financials and healthcare. Then, uh, that, at that point, when you see an improvement in relative strength is when I think they deserve your further attention. Until now, stay diligent and stay focused on where we're seeing outperformance. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to David Cox of Raymond James joining us from Ontario. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow.